Now we wake up to another, just an absolute another beautiful snowy cold day. It's about 10 degrees. First thing I want to do this morning, because Mike is out with the snowblower, and I want to get this project moving along. I mixed up the white paint. These are all primed up. I'm going to spray a couple of coats of white on them, a couple of coats of clear, and tomorrow Mike will be able to put those back on his plane. But they really did come out nice. That's a nice shape for a wheel pan. And of course he can replace the wheel pan. So that'll, and then that'll finish one more little project. We need to work on a cowling. We need to make an outer wing tip, a couple other little projects, but we have to work around this tremendous cold temperature that's here. And I'm always curious about Brodak dope, just how cold it has to be before you have to stop painting. Now it's, they said it was 10 this morning, probably by, because the sun is out, it's warmed up to about 12, but we're still, again, I'm painting with a low pressure trying to just put on just a little bit of paint at a time. The reason is, if you put a big thick coat on, it's going to take a long time to dry out in the garage with that cold temperature. But, and I would say it's best in really cold temperature to, you know, if you can paint in a house. Unfortunately, I can't do that. Even in a garage, it's 10 degrees. It's, it's hopeless, but this tells me something about the Brodak dope that even in, even in the coldest conditions, you can get a really nice finish like this. And that's just one coat of white on there. Now I'm going to give this a couple hours to dry before I put a coat of clear on it, but it's really looking like it's going to dry up well. See, I just, I've heard all kind of things that you can't paint below this temperature or below that temperature, but you know, that doesn't take into account the old fact that when you have to, you have to. And Mike wanted to get this done today, so uh, <coughs> if it didn't work, it's his wheel pants. Anyway, it looks like, and I did check the, I have the, the TV thing on to see the temperature every morning to see just where I stand, and it was 10 degrees this morning. So if this dries up nicely and buffs out nicely, well, I don't know. Now we all know it's best, the first part of this would be, the best would be to wait. Wait for some warm weather. You know what the problem is? People like us, we're impatient, we can't wait. If you're trying to force a paint job through and for whatever reason to run off the VSC or to run off with the, uh, the grill next door, let's, these are some of the things I've found to work. Usually mix up the paint at a ratio that I can paint at about 25 to 20 PSI. Now normally I try to paint at 15 to 20, a thinner mix. You need more pressure for a thicker mix. Now the reason for the thicker mix is in cold weather you want to use a little less thinner. Now this doesn't really make sense. What you would think would happen is it's the opposite. You'd thin the paint, make it more watery. Well, I've found, and again, you know, other people have found other ways of doing this. This is certainly not the only way to do it. But I've found by making a relatively thick mix, and this may be 60% dope, just a rough number, 40% thinner, spraying out a little, a little higher pressure. See, this is exactly the opposite of what you would think would happen. But the problem with, with a lot of things like this is it works. And today was living proof. You know, we're out there and it's, it's 10 to 12 degrees. It looks like everything's drying up real nice. We'll find out when it dries, if it buffs out normally. We're going to find out. But this is a good little tip. And it's be because I've found that people do exactly the opposite. They say, oh, it's cold, I'll make the paint thinner. Yeah, and I've tried that too, and I've had some success. But the best success I've had when it really, really gets cold, and I mean, I'm sure if you, if you, uh, you know, you talk to professional body shop people, they're just going to say, oh, that, you know, no good, you know, because you, the reason is because you really wouldn't paint cars or things like that. But because these parts are small, 
And because they sit outside really for about 20 minutes in the cold, and then I bring them into a warm house to dry, I just try to get most of the gassing off outside so I don't have the smell in the house. But this is this has definitely worked for us today. Notice one of the things I did today, try to get the paint drying. Because I'm trying to use time management. I'm going to be back in the shop tonight. So I want to get things that need drying time done. The other thing too is I'm going to work on a tip weight box for a little while. Now a couple of things people may or may not really have an understanding of. Here's what happens. If you make a heavy inboard tip, well, every little bit of weight that you put out here, you have to put the same amount out there. So if you add a quarter of an ounce here, in essence, you've added a half ounce to the plane because you need the other quarter of an ounce just to bring you back to neutral, like a seesaw. So one of the things now, I've spent a lot of time making this inboard tip really light don't know how successful we are because it, it's irrelevant right now. And I've noticed some people that run around weighing, oh, this weighs two grams and I did the tip at one gram and this cap strip at, and in the end the plane is too heavy. Uh, so something they're doing is wrong. I'm not sure what. But one of the things I did, now I normally would take he much heavier wood because I wouldn't be hollowing the outboard tip as much. The reason I want to hollow this tip out as much as possible is because we want to have the option of putting the, and we're not going to not going to guarantee have to do this, but we want to have the option of putting that about one ounce Sanyo battery for the Zetron as tip weight. If we wind up with one ounce of lead as the final trim, I'll figure a way to get that tip weight there. And I made sure I have a straight shot through the holes, just like the lead outs, that I could run the wire through. So the goal normally, this tip weight box, number one, I'm going to make the box a little bit bigger physically, and I'm going to hollow the tip more than I normally do. Two things that would be just a little bit different. But anyway, I'll start the same pattern, cut the pieces out of what I hope is going to be, this looks like five pound wood. It looks like relatively good wood, where normally I don't have to use good wood up on this. And I'm going to try again to, to allow myself enough physical room in the box for the option of using the Zetron battery as tip weight if that becomes one of the choices. Now because our wingtip is just slightly bigger than two inches and these blocks are just undersized by about a sixteenth of an inch. So what I've needed to do is make a little extra piece too that normally if you have a thinner wing tip or thicker blocks, if you use inch and a quarter blocks, of course you don't need to the little extra piece. But if one of the funniest stories I ever remember is we have somebody, unfair to mention a name, but built this beautiful wing, comes running over to the shop to show me this, this three ounce wing, and whoa, look, look what I did, I figured out how to make the tip weight box out of, out of you know, 30 second balsa, no bolt holding anything in. So, yeah, that saved a quarter of an ounce. The wing was light. Yeah, yeah, yeah. First time he flew the plane, the little weights in there just vibrated through the box, actually ate a hole through the box, went flying out, almost went through Jimmy Casale's plane, which Jimmy was not too uh, thrilled about, by the way. In fact, it's one of the stories whenever I see Jimmy, I always remind him of. <laughs> but anyway, it, a, a super lightweight tip weight box is really not an efficient choice and and it isn't one of the things I'm trying for other than the fact that I may want to use that little battery pack and that little battery pack is in the neighborhood of an ounce or if somebody Don Dixon or somebody can come up with some lighter weight batteries to power that little uh, z the little Zetron receiver and the servo the next step is to tack glue them all together on a flat surface is to get this down on a flat surface before we put the tack on. Just one drop will do it. A couple of drops, let these blocks tack glue together, then I'll run them on a belt sander, get them nice and even, and then trace out the shape on the uh, off of the end of the wingtip. Okay, lining this up, most important thing, I want to get my center lines lined up. I 
my center lines there and I want to real carefully now with this taped in place get a nice clean ink line on it and then leave the ink line on now what I do to rough carbon on this I'll leave the ink line on not try to get too cute another thing too I want to leave a little bit of extra material in the back because it tends the trailing edge tends to always get out of uh, out of line you always wind up wanting to add in fact I had to add a piece to the other side a little bit to that okay now that's ready same as the inner tip I'll try to get as much of this material off of here as I can it'll just make once I get this put in place make carving it a lot easier and then the final shaping because I don't have to deal with the wing being attached while I'm chomping away at these edges starting to really shape up one at a time but getting all this material off such a big help and once we get this both sides the same as this and I'll tack glue this in place okay now it's in rough carved state now I need to go back pick up the same center lines glue this right back in place temporary glue on Now, once I get these center lines on, I just want to very tack glue this on. I guess the most disappointing thing here is when you put too much glue on and then when you go to cut it off, and I've done that. Okay, now I'm ready to do the final shaping on this. You can see roughly I have just a little bit extra material in every dimension. Before I go any further, I'll do so pretty much the same as I did on the inner tip. Get one layer of green tape to go around the perimeter here, and that gives me an extra edge. That'll, it'll force me to leave just a little bit of material extra on the tip. Tape? I'll help you put some tape on this winger at Nowski. <laughs> Say hello to Bruz Brodak. <laughs> Bruz, who? Come on, I gotta get to work. Get off, he flies on my hand. Any carving operation, it's always good to give yourself a little, a little bit of a gauge here. This will ensure that I won't get the part too thin. But this part will stay the thickness of the tape heavier as I carve into that tape. It just leaves just that little bit of material it leaves a few thousands on there that's ready to do the final shaping now this is where I really start to be sure I don't get into any big thick cuts all nice little ice shavings go right up to the tape and then try to continue that final little angle out There's something about modeling when you know it's 10 degrees outside. In between phone calls here, I really get a, I get the feeling I'm kind of lucky being able to do this instead of working outside today with Mike. <laughs> Mike's out there with the snowblower making money. Anyway, all ice shavings right up to that green line. I try not to go at this point in time leave a little bit extra on even and not get the part as soon as I see I'm touching that green tape I want to do the final not really final shaping because once this is hollowed we'll take the last 64th of an inch off The only thing left to do is take the tape off, take a brand new blade, remove the tip. It's 
is what I love. When you get... <laughs> I'm trying to use a brand new razor blade. Every once in a while you just hit one of these spots with a little bit too much glue in, in there. Yes, it happens to everybody. And if it doesn't, they're lying to you. See, that's caught on something. I wanted to show this. Somewhere in there, some of our CA wicked its way down in there. And I don't want to just force it, needless to say. But as always happens, this is a good thing you can pick up off the tape. So tape wouldn't be much good if everything went right all the time. Oh, ah, whole wing's broken in half. No, just kidding. We have a chunk of wood here, but it won't matter. It's not a part we need. I'll just have to dress this edge off. Times I've glued the tip on, and, and without realizing it, it's up or it's down. So it's always good before we do the final glue and to get this screwed up. Now I know there's a chunk of wood on there. We want to put on a little rough line for the eighth inch hollow one. We get some rough spots in that wood. We'll fill those in with little repair plugs. Remember, we're trying to make a uh, more than normal. A lighter than normal, even though uh, normally you wouldn't need that. Only so that if we can use the, we have the option to use this tip weight box, we're going to make it a little bit larger than normal too. There's that piece of wood that's stuck there. On the top piece, we're going to lay out what'll be the uh the act look at this piece of drum the actual i'm going to leave extra room here give me some reference lines to carve to the bottom half of this i'm trying to lay out normally normally i would want the tip weight box to be as far forward as possible but because of the shape of this tip just not really practical so I'm going to basically go from about here to about here. Again, I want to be able to thread wires through here. If we decide to use this option, normally you wouldn't have to make it anywhere as near as large as this. Using a piece of tape to lay this out. You don't want to have the tip weight box go to the very edge because this edge gets too thin and fine. I'm going to leave an extra little amount. Now, the next thing I need to do is go over to the jigsaw and just cut out. If you follow through step by step, it doesn't matter what the tip weight box shape is. I wouldn't make this any thinner, otherwise you don't have the support up here where you need it. These two lines aren't really critical, but I like to keep them 90 degrees just so it looks like, a, uh, you know, has a little bit of a professional look to it. And the way I go through here is I just go right through with the saw blade. But now, if you see how I transpose that up onto the top, and this is important. Because if, if you get off on these angles and they're not 90 degrees, it's a problem. Now I know where these angles are. I'm going to make myself a transposition of that shape right out onto the top here with everything 90 degrees. And I can just use the tape to lay that extra thickness out. Now with these lines laid out in tape, just roughly, now I can go over to the saw and because this line is going to be flat and the blade is 90 degrees, it'll give me, I'm using this, this surface here to set all the cuts to 90 degrees. And this one here, you know, you could do this by hand, it isn't real critical. 
This makes it a little bit nicer if you can do it that way. Now with the tape off, what I do is go in, I have my lock on both sides, I can go in on one side with the saw blade, go from corner to corner to corner to corner and come out and I'll have an exact hatch that'll sit right at 90 degrees in one saw cut. What I'm using, I'm using a saw table actually as my 90 degree edge to hold 90 degrees here. Now since I've already gone in through there, there's no point running a saw back through. I can just put a little piece of scrap in there, but now, once this is glued on the tip, I have these, imagine trying to cut all these angles by hand, and I have a block, it should be a nice 90 degree fit. Okay, now I need to know where that hatch is going to rest in here, because I need to come up with some blind nut system. And a hatch this big, what I'm going to try to do is get one blind nut in the front, one in the back. A hatch this big, I think, needs more than one blind nut. And that'll give me all the room in the center for putting my either batteries or tip weight. Now that lays that out. Now I know where that hatch is going to roughly reside. Now these will be our two hole down. These are going to be flat surfaces. Eventually they'll be plywood, of course. But I mark these. This is just because my eyes are so bad I run a Dremel tool into them. These are going to get removed eventually. But these are the flat surfaces that I need to work off. And the reason for having these flat surfaces, this lines everything up. This is my, my alignment for my tip weight box. And when I drop the tip weight box down in there, Oh, I always like to true up all these edges also, just to get them, the saw blade leaves little irregularities. You could also harden up all these edges with thin CA as a way of protecting them just a little bit. Using a Dremel tool with the, uh, the ball end, I can take all of this material out. I just need to save myself a little ledge here. The reason I mark this is because real boy my eyes are really going bad lately. I don't need enough carrots I don't think. That I have to leave on. Everything else in here I can remove and actually create my tip weight, the area where the tip weight box will reside. The tool for this is the little carbide bar. You can see how quickly this takes material off. So what I do, I like to go one way. As soon as I'm done with one way, I just work it back the other way. This way I can feel that I'm not going, getting too close. You can see how quickly that cuts. I'm going to get the rest of this material that I want. Is I want a tip weight box that remember the, the volume, and I also want to be able to run wires through here. So maybe I'll take this edge out just in case. I want to be able to run my wires right through the where the leadouts would normally run on the other wing. And just when you think you can never get, you can never paint road out. How, how cold do you really think it is? It's probably 15 by now, huh?
I'd say that is a nice material to work with. Alright, get that, put it out in the garage to dry. It's probably warm enough out there now, it's 15 degrees. And I'm going to finish up that tip weight box. Okay, now Mike has buffed up his, uh, <laughs> what shall we call us? The Cardinal Professional Plug. Ooh, that came out nice. <laughs> okay, now we got to make a box. You watch me do this enough times. We got to make a box to confine the molding rubber. We want to leave about three quarters of an inch around the whole perimeter. And I guess we could make a little block here just to save material. Okay, we want to true all the box edges at 90 degrees when Mike makes the box up. We've done this enough times to know pretty much all oh, that's going to be nice. Screwing up everything at 90 degrees on the belt sander for the box. Even though this doesn't have to be real fancy. And while we're doing that, we're trying to multitask here. See, this is the whole thing which all, that I feel like I'm pretty good at. No, maybe good, I don't know. Multitasking, doing this, having paint dry, having plugs being made. All right, baby, you know the deal. Uh, nothing special about making a box, but what we're going to do is when we pour the rubber, if, if we wind up, we need just a little eighth inch more, we can fill this area here with a plug. Again, just to save material. And there's nothing special about making a box, but I love that box, those plexiglass things George Venturini had. Except he won't share them with me. We'll mix the molding rubber as we always do. No sense putting that back on video. It's, it's on a million videos already. And we want to pour that right up to the, until we bury this part by about a quarter of an inch. Biggest trick with molding rubber, and this is Mike's first pour, so we're kind of going through it step by step. When you think it's poured, stir it another two minutes slow. Now I want to pour it as slow as you can all around the perimeter. You don't want to pour it and cover some air, Mike. Right. Pour it on a telephone. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Mike, look in here because he's doing up the second pour. Look at this. We're getting, this is the phone call record for this. We want to try to pick out all these little air bubbles in here while we can. That was a one ring phone call. Before the phone rang and I ran over and picked up the video camera and turned it on. I said, what's this? Nothing happened. Anyway, Mike, what I want to show you here is you just want to go back and forth now, kind of slurry this along. Yeah, somebody didn't dial a phone right. Let's see, let's see who's on the phone now. Just roll it around and pick out all the air bubbles. Okay, the next thing is we're going to just let this sit up by the heating vent overnight. That really was true. I did. The phone rings and I run and answered the video camera. Anyway, we are multitasking. We're going to get back to working on that tip weight box. But, but the purpose I'm trying to make is a lot of times in the shop, I need to be able to do two or three jobs in one day. A lot of people think you just sit down here and do one thing at a time. Nah. But being able to multitask, get the dope drying first, get the molding rubber drying. Once those things are drying, then it's real easy. We can go over here and finish up this tip weight. And this will be a relatively straightforward finish gouging that out. But if we don't do that, if we do this first and this second and the dope at the end of the day, then, well, multitasking has made uh, a lot of things possible for me that otherwise would not be possible. Good time management. We're back to carving the rest of this out. Let me get the rest of this done so we can try to finish this up in this session. I want to make an access hole so I can thread the wires through if we decide to use that Z-Tron. Again, this is a unique, ba uh, a unique ba battery box. Yeah, answer the video camera. But one of the things that I wanted to do is give myself quality options. Now clean this up in here. Next thing I need to do is remove an eight, exactly an eighth of an inch out of each one of these little wedges and make my plywood, the little supports out of eighth inch plywood that are going to hold the blind nuts. And by keeping this roughly an eighth of an inch, what I want to do is make sure that that piece will be completely parallel to this when I'm finished because this sets in 
the ledge that the box, I want to keep these parallel. But having these little feet here, this makes for a nice, uh, a nice little way of aligning it. Remember, in the olden days, and I was, I was one of the first ones that I just really made me crazy. I'd make a tip weight box, and then I'd try to carve this block, the block to fit this, and I would just go bananas. And it would be hours and hours, and I'd just go crazy trying to figure out exactly how to do it. Using this method, I think it's relatively easy. But each part on this, right, each step follows the next step. Each part lines up the part before it, and that's what makes it easy. There's no, there's no uh, where you're trying to build a bridge in midair. Eighth inch light ply, I'm going to strip off a piece to make the two braces. Now I'm stripping off little pieces like this. I just need to eyeball up what the angle is. I want to make the two pieces because I want to have the two blind nuts confining this. And a hatch, if this hatch were half the size for a normal plane, I'd only need one screw. Okay, now I have these two pieces, but the next thing, I don't want to glue them in. I just want to put the sl slightest drop of glue on here. But most of all, I want to make sure just one teensy bit of a drop. Make sure these surfaces are flat because these are going to align my cover. This is the tricky part. This is the part that saves you a lot of time. I have this. I'm looking for this an equal edge around here. And I can just carefully take this piece off while holding this in position. And now, just holding this in position, I can drill both of these at the same time. And I can do it with the drill press. That should be right about where I want it. Now, I can take this off. By using this on a drill press, I'll get a dead 90 degree hold. And I'll come back here and use this to line this all up. See, one part, one part sets the other part in place. That's what makes this a nice system. Of course, these holes are drilled at exactly 90 degrees. Again, this is the, the part that I like, is that one part kind of aligns the other part. You can just line these up, kind of line this up so we have it even. And if you make too big of a gap, you can always fill it with 64th plywood. Okay, now I take just a pointed piece of eighth inch. It's going to go right in there and leave an impression. And this is exactly our alignment guide for drilling the holes. There's our alignment guide for drilling the holes for the blind nuts. And once, now see I've marked this one on this side. I just break that temporary glue. Now I can drill these, put the blind nuts in, and then glue them permanently in. Nice as I can get the blind nuts glued. I put a little bit of Warren Walker's penetrating oil in there so that the screws don't the, the CA doesn't creep in and get on the threads. And I can just glue these right in place. And I have that little alignment line. Of course I do, right there. But I can line up the alignment line. Next step is I need to put two strips of 16th plywood along the bottom here, but keeping them perfectly parallel to the bottom. Reason for that is we're going to wind up as this clamshells together, we don't want to lose our dimension. I can just strip off two strips here, and then what I do, put it back in the drill press and use these for the guide to drill the holes. This allows the plywood to, to maintain a nice flush edge. This is just 60, 60 plus 16 plywood. Because I already have the holes drilled, I can drill down this way, that'll hold me at 90 degrees. That's a nice step. Each step sets the other step. The plywood piece is attached. I can get a perfectly flat surface. I go over to the drill press using this as a guide and just drill the holes just for the bolt shanks of the 440 bolts.
No, I always try to make sure these are a, a relatively tight fit on a 440 so that this can't rock back and forth. If you know, these bolts are in place. Now, so let's say this was cocked off one way or another because the mounts are tack glued on. Well, we could break them loose and just move them if we had to, but this is held on. And we could slide this around, move the mounts. But now that we know we have the alignment that we're looking for, we're kind of comfortable with the alignment. Like I said, we're real comfortable with the alignment. Here we go. Okay, now I know I have a nice even piece around all sides. Now the next thing I can do is just tack glue these together. Now I don't want to glue it permanently because I don't want to glue it with these screws in here. I want these screws to be out of here. Otherwise, I take a chance on gluing a whole piece together. Just all I'm using this the door for now is a nice square perimeter, and I can just tack glue that in place. The, each thing is lining up the next thing down the road. Before I, I've been jiggling around with this, making sure I have the fit that I want. Once I'm sure of that, now I want to take even a little more of the wood out of here. Just to make this, of course, I want to leave these the beams in here that'll hold the hatch cover. But just to get some extra weight out. Again, this is a specialty, one of a kind thing we're doing here. But this is really a nice way to do it. Every time I do one of these, I'm always satisfied, thinking, "Wow, it's a pretty good way to do it." But the main thing is now we have all our fits and alignments and everything. Now we can get in here and hollow as much more of this material as we want out and then we can still put it back together this will take a couple of minutes over by the I can get some material out of here probably get some material out of here maybe a little bit here okay this was some of the final hollow when I did again so I can mount my battery pack now I need to make a little plate in here Add a plywood with a screw so I can hold the end or tip weight. I guess I'll put it toward the thickest part of the wing, which is going to be here. Uh, let's see, because I want to be able to, if I have to put that battery in here, or maybe shove the battery in there, but I need to have a screw. I sure wouldn't want to just leave it laying around in there like <coughs> somebody else I know. Won't mention any names. But just one thought is, because I've got this tip really light and hollowed out, one of the things I may luck out and be able to uh, to put that whole battery pack out there, but if I were to leave this solid, then in essence I'm adding to the model because what I'm doing, if I can use that battery pack in a tip instead of in a fuselage, well, one of the things it's going to do it'll make the ma the total model an ounce lighter, and that certainly would be worth striving for here. But even if we don't use that option, just having it as an option or a trim feature. I think it's going to be worth the time and energy. It's a good idea when you make up the little plug, just give it as good a footprint as you can. I ground off the head of the bolt, made a little recess in here, because I don't want the I, I don't want the weight to be way up here. I like it to be right about in the middle, and by the time I put six or seven of these quarter inch weights, or what I'll do with this is make myself a little battery box and put the battery box down with this. So trying to give myself as many options and I can run the wires right through here when I'm done if that becomes the choice. Now this is ready to glue in here let's just see. This completes this and any edge I want to harden up here I want to get a I want the wood around this to be good and hard I want this. Now, I know I know the mistake I made at one time I, I thought I'd be real cute I put a blind nut in here put the screw down it came right out the top of the wing of course not it was a thing that was not thought through well this is thought through I think reasonably well and I think it's it's at a skill level that just about anybody can make one of these boxes even if you don't make it as fancy as this before we do the final gluing I want to cut myself two little pieces of tubing same as we did on the uh, the gear blocks that'll protect those holes and if we're going to put a battery in here, this cover is going to be coming off a lot, so we want to protect them as much as possible. You want to glue this in position with the bolt here, because the bolt, it's a very tight fit on the bolt head, and the bolt head lines it up. But I just want to tack it in place. 
what's happened in the past when I've tried to put a permanent, you know, glob of glue on there. Well, sometimes you glue the bolt in place too. We'll just make sure we have it now. Now we've, we're in good shape. Now grind these off, and we'll be ready to put this whole thing together and attach it to the plane. I like the way these little edges give it a nice little professional look. This is the last we're going to do tonight. We'll pick this up tomorrow, but I think this is a yeah, worth evaluating here. This will be ready to install on a wing. And then do the final sanding tomorrow after that's all tacked together. And come up on the last of the details of this wing. And I think tomorrow we'll be able to kind of put the lid on that tip weight box, control horn, and start making our flaps. Now in today's mail, from our friend Paul Winter, and Paul has a uh, pretty interesting thing here from this is, let's see what is a 19, a 1966 magazine, Aero Modeler. Look at this, it's one of the, uh, the original articles, look at this, the original four strokes back in 1966. Anyway, Paul made me some copies of this, and you can get some copies of this article if you're interested or collecting these type of things from Paul Winter. Interesting stuff. Very interesting. How oh, old well, this magazine is. Look what's for sale. Look, Jet Go Shark 45s and McCoy engines. McCoy two-strokes. Unbelievable. Paul, we appreciate it. Anyway, Paul's considering something like this. He made me some Xerox copies for his one of his future models. He also sent a nice note that he's having nothing but good luck with his Sato 72 and 56. Paul, if you only had that much success with women, you'd be all set. Anyway, thanks a lot. Paul Winter? Why, well, he's the only one of the stunt flyers in the world that I don't find personally attractive. Paul, we love you, guy, but uh, hey, the girls don't. Now, today, the last little job I need to do is to glue this on, put a final sanding on it. One little tip that may be worth mentioning is, although I try to get this piece wanted to show this so I have an equal I'm, I'm framing a picture here if I can show this okay and then just tack glue it on and then take the box off the reason is when you try a glue seam what can happen is you wind up gluing the box in place and then you're really in big trouble and the last step is to blend in once this is glued on This is where having a padded table pays off. And even with this, I still get dents in from time to time. I want to get a nice easement as this comes around the corner here. Okay, we're one step further ahead now next step on this is going to be to make the horn up, but we have some work to do. I don't know what else we're going to get done today. steps I wanted to do because this edge if I'm anticipating fishing wires through here this edge is going to take a beating so I wanted to make this edge 64th plywood I just glued in a piece and now I'll trim that off and make sure that I have the good clearance around the hatch again this is one of the things I tack glued this in place without the hatch because I was afraid some CA would get on the hatch the first time you do that you'll say oh yeah I saw that on a windy video he's dumb he did it too I just need to trim that off, 
put a final sanding on all this. And we're finished with the outer tip at last. Final sanding, I just always, always have the the block in place because that's gonna set as I work my way down toward the tip. Like I said, as I answer the phone for President Nixon, just can't seem to finish this today. Now Mike's gonna do a little demo of how to make a stooge since he's in the middle of a production run of stooges. So let me see, these are the, these are the raw wood pieces you made. This is cabinet wood? What is that, maple? Oak. 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 This is Mike's stooge that he sells commercially and from time to time, from time to time, does a production run. Whenever he has none of that good outdoor snowy work, he wants to be in a cellar with Wendy for a couple of days. Anyway, nice oak. Okay, the other part of this is the little handles. Now, what do you do? You cut these out by hand from oak. What do you do? Buy a whole sheet of this down at the lumber yard? Yeah. I never, I, I need to steal the secrets of this business here. <laughs> okay, so you cut these out with the jigsaw. Yeah. Okay, and what this is, uh, let's see. Handles. Cut this all routed bit or sanded by hand? By hand. Okay. Just round them off, they go in there. And you got these, this is Mike's own design, his and of course, this is my my chosen my chosen brand of stuff. <laughs> okay, these are the uprights, dowels. Drill this out. They glued brass hinges. We'll try to show what this now. A lot of people think, oh yeah, I'll just make one of these in 15 minutes. <laughs> it ain't gonna happen, pal. No, no, no. Now I could picture you know, one of my favorite people, Paul Winter, saying, eh, I'll make my own in five minutes. Yeah. <laughs> Forget it. Go ahead. This is, is a very time consuming job, especially when you want to make one, you got to get 10. But anyway, we'll be able to fill some of the back orders on these. Needless to say, if you want one of these stooges, get a hold of Mike. Phone number 991 5182 201. You got it. Okay. Stooge business. This is what you need to be in a stooge. You need $2,000 worth of stuff from Home Depot. <laughs> Maybe we should go out of the stooge yeah, business at, today. Bolt sandwich. Why didn't we go in a donut business? <laughs> yeah. Oh my god. Ginges. This looks a lot this looks like more work than building tip weight boxes. Yeah, I think it is. Alright, let's get some of these puppies put together here, baby. We One thing I like about Mike's stooge design, it is really bulletproof, this. It's epoxied, screwed, what else, Mike? And epoxied. Then epoxied more, the little piece that, that actually holds the plane from releasing is carbon fiber. High quality, I love that. All the holes are pre-drilled. And any of the people that think you could just knock one of these out in 15 minutes, I love it. Go home, make one. <laughs> yep. They, I wish they'd make them for me. I'll sell them. Yeah, that's a lot of work. This little stooge business here has been growing regularly, and you can see, just like any other little home business, how much material you have. You wind up buying screws and bolts and hinges and parts and plates, and when you're all done, somebody says, oh! I can make that in two minutes. <laughs> yeah, I can't wait to see somebody knock one of these out. Now, an old trick when you're putting screws into oak, and of course these are all pre-drilled and pre-countersunk, what's the trick? He gets soap. All right, what a good boy. I didn't know you were this cool. Oh, yeah. You know all the tricks. <laughs> Boy, that's beautiful. Fresh mounted screws, epoxy, oak, brass hinges, carbon fiber release pins. I'm just so impressed. <laughs> now if we could only get them anodized, that would be just perfect. Yeah, that's a good trick. It's an old carpenter's trick. Put soap on a wood screw when you put this is for a tight 
I'm walking around a shop. The wheel pants are drying up beautifully. We're going to buff them out tomorrow or the next day. Wouldn't be good. At least you get your hands clean, too, while you're using that yeah. soap. <laughs> but it's tough work. I know you'd rather be out shoveling snow with the snowblower. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. All of a sudden, Wendy's shop doesn't look like such a bad place. <laughs> such a bad place to spend the day, huh? I bet the birds outside are wishing they could be peeps. Hey! Hey, you want to go outside with the outside birds? And what are the quality steps Mike takes here that I think it's worth mentioning? All of the screws are sealed with thin CA, then sanded back down to flat. I mean, a lot of people that would be making a stooge would just be thinking, ah, so what, you know, just... This is really a work of art when he's done with it. And if anybody ever breaks one of these, I don't think a B-29 could break one of these. All hand sanded. See, most of the work is hand sanding, hand labor. Yours didn't break in how many years you've been running it? Well, listen, if I don't break something, it isn't going to break. Well, That's... That's the that, test that for breakage. It. That was it. They pay me to break things. That's why I gave you the first one. It says, here, it's yours. Yeah. See if it breaks. <laughs> okay. See how much quality this goes into this stooge. This is both hardwood dowels, countersunk and epoxied. Then the hinges are screwed through with triple screws, which are then CA'd in place. And that's only, the, this is the easy part. The next part of this is going to be a lot of hand labor. Dressing this off and then carbon fiber on the whole bottom of this. Mike really puts a lot of time. I don't know if we've, we've certainly not, uh, I guess in the last 10 years, done a video on how to make a stooge. But I think from looking at this, if, if you're so inclined that you want to spend the time and the money and the labor. I had the aluminum one and I had the hardwood one, but... This is certainly, you can you can get probably even a set of plans for a mic for a paltry $150. <laughs> and this is how one starts off as a piece of, actually furniture wood oak, to lay out the port. Now there's several parts of this that, and this is very important, is the dremeling in here for the tail wheel. There's a lot of thought went into making a stooge. This isn't just, just a flat piece of wood with two dowels on it. Believe me, there's a lot of engineering went into this and how the release mechanism works and all the fail-safe features. Now these are what hold the hinges in, right? Yeah. And all the mics, the hinges that are held in. 632 blind nuts, C8 in place. The, end, the other end of the part that actually releases the plane. And if you think a lot of this stuff is easy or you could just crank it out in five minutes, just do it. Okay. Uh, I put so many holes in here, and those guys are flying in grass on grass yeah. fields. Right. Sometimes you hear rock in one spot, sometimes you hear this, and that, and that. Well, like what Jacobone, he puts the thing in and the plane's on a 30 degree angle. Right. So now you have, you know, all You have a lot of choices, plus you have a leverage on, you know? Show me that again. When you want to fly in grass, you got the big yeah. aluminum nails. Yeah, two spikes will come with it. I'll kind right. of sink these so this will sit flush. But this is the part. Mm -hmm. If you don't do the tailwheel part, and this, this, I admit, the one I had the aluminum one, it was flat, and the plane to go boom. Yeah, and your chip crops, there. yeah. Okay. Don't even vacuum it up. I'm going to use it for doing my stuff. Now, after some extensive carving here, this is ready to wrap with carbon fiber. Now, over the years, I don't know, a lot of people don't know this, but I've done a lot of sheetrock work <laughs> on sheetrock, not on aeroplane. One of the products that I really like, this DAP Vinyl Spackle. Now this is, when you go to buy spackle, there's a couple of t the tricks that I've learned over the years. Even Mike went and bought this stuff called Light Spackle. You pick up the can, it's so light, you go, oh, I'll put that on my plane. And what happens, it just, 
it chunks out. The paint doesn't stick to it anywhere near as well as the vinyl. A couple of the tricks that I found with the vinyl spackle, you really have to stir it up, and I don't know why. This doesn't look like an old can. Another thing is, every year when I get to this point in the model, buy a new can. Using up the old can is not, it's, it's like air epoxy light. It isn't, there's a shelf life to this. It seems to dry out. I'm not sure why. I've tried adding water to it. That doesn't really seem to work as well as I'd like, as well as just having a new can. As careful as I try to be, I always wind up with little dings and little places where my <coughs> illustrious uh, friends come over and handle a wing. I saw a, a mark in here yesterday. Anyway, with Mike working on Stooges in the shop, and we're making cowling molds and everything, there's just a lot of stuff. There's a lot of bouncing around going on. Right here, there's a spot. There's little spots up in the leading edge here. Let me just... Now, usually, if they're rounded spots, one of the ways you can do this is feel it with your hand, and don't look. Just fill it. And give that... Well, I'll give this a time to dry an hour is good, depending on the temperature in the shop. And it is cold in the shop. We try to keep it cool anyway. Anytime I see a little spot like this in the wood, that's going to show in the final finish. You almost don't have to sand that down, but that'll fill that in. But I found the vinyl does work, for me anyway, the best under my shop conditions. Here's a little spot where I had to do a repair. I made a little cork with balsa wood. Well, this will just feather it right in. And this, this sands so easily, you almost don't have to sand it. And what I like about the vinyl, the dope sticks to it like iron. The reason I like to fill in these little imperfections now, because once they're sanded out, and you get down to where this is really a final sanding, well, somewhere today, well, tomorrow, we'll do a relatively final sanding, I want to pick out every little imperfection. Every one you can is one less place that you're going to wind up getting over here, a potential bubble in the finish, because you'll just have a blob of air in there and it'll expand. So anything you can fill in, and just for general overall quality, before I give this a final sanding. Now, the thing that we're going to be doing today, maybe today and tomorrow, I want to work on Mike's cow mold. We've got a couple people already waiting for a cow mold, I've promised them. And <coughs> we've been doing so many other things here. We want to finish up a couple of stooges. Mike's got a back order list on stooges. So what we're trying to do is plan out a day. But again, I'm using time management. Notice what's the first thing I'm doing in the day is get something going that's drying. And while that's drying, work on something that I don't have to wait to dry. Good time management. If you can see this, what I'm trying to do is I shut all the lights off in the shop except for the one right on top of the part. And I'm trying to candle it the way you would candle paint. Because a lot of times, even, even small areas, by doing them this way, you'll find a little, there's a spot right here. There's a, now let's get it up close if we can. With the lights out, I can see a little shadow there. So I know there's a little low spot right there. But again, before I do the final sanding on this, I'll put the DAP away to dry while we work on other projects. But always using my time management. First thing of the day, get, get something drying. Get it up by a heating vent. This DAP, it'll probably be dry in, in 20 minutes, but we have so many other projects to work on. It's best to just let it dry most of the day. But this is a good way to find little imperfections, and I just look. And you'd be surprised. A lot of times you don't even feel a little, there'll be a little low spot, but when you hold it up in the shadow and candle it, you'll see it. One final little thing I thought I'd mention, because it really is, it's one of the things I've used from time to time. If you come along, and, and in the case you're working on something or sanding it, and say you hit it with your fingernail, your watch, your belt buckle, and you just put a little dent in it, a lot of times what you can do is just take a little a Q-tip with some Windex and just wet it. If you wet it right away, you, if those wood cells are crushed, a lot of times they'll just come right back up in a matter of four or five minutes. Now, I did a couple last, no, last night, I had a spot in here. I, 
I show you how good it is. I can't find the spot now. There was a spot where I, I really had stuck my finger. Or what? Oh, here it is right here. Yeah, I lied. Now this spot last night, I don't know what I was doing. Maybe it up close. You see, I really, I really had a giant gouge in there. I don't know if I, I was probably holding it like this or something. Usually you do more damage by holding things. But, but now I know that this little area is not going to come out with just a little bit of Windex. I put a little bit of Windex on before I went to sleep. And I thought, oh, maybe it'll come out. Well, it really didn't all come out. So now what's perfect is there's no point wetting it again. It's about 90% better than it was. Another thing about DAP, I don't like to get it up on edges and corners. It doesn't, it doesn't have a lot of strength. So it's really not good to be to like be making an, an edge of a hinge line or something with it. Here's some pinholes. But the best spot is there's always little spots where the leading edge, at least I, I seem to get them. And I just can just take a tiny little bit of this. And when you're done, typically the part is a, a legram or two lighter than when you started. Because by the time you sand this down, you've removed even more material. The valley that you've filled in is smaller than the mountain tops you remove. So the next step, it's one of my favorite steps. Let's put it aside to dry. Get working on some of the other projects here that we really are excited about seeing some of these other things like Mike's cowling should be ready today. Mike's finishing up a batch of stooges. By the way, we didn't put a step by step by step on a stooges because typically when he makes a batch of them, it goes over a period of days. He does a lot of bases and a lot of, and he, he just you just can't put it all one one on one thing back to back. But those stooges really are beautiful, and I've used one. I don't know how many years. This is going to be three years, and so far we've had that thing that I like, a no hitter or a no releaser. Anyway, I really spend a lot more time, and I allocate the time. It's not like I'm you know I'm. In the overall picture, I'm saving time. By spending an hour or two at this point in the job, I'm going to save five or six hours when it comes to sanding filler and buffing and trying to fill imperfections. The sooner that there's a golden rule that I use, the sooner you can fill a valley or sand a mountaintop, the, the further ahead you are in the game. Because later on, you're not sanding that same valley or peak or trying to straighten something out six, eight, ten, fifteen times. See, like here's one I just didn't see. It's a little but but if I spend an hour now, even an hour is okay because because basically it's real early. The chickens aren't up yet. But I can get this stuff dry and then the rest of my work day, I'm one step ahead of the game. But it's an important point to put on the video to the the spackle that I'm using because I have had terrible luck with that light spackle. I don't remember which plane. I think it was the Griffin. We we did the whole plane, of, just like I'm doing right now, with that light spackle. And later on, everywhere where there was spackle, the paint was peeling up. Every little spot had a bubble, and a, it was really uh, very disappointing. But I'm using this, this candling technique. And it may seem like, wow, you know, eh, who wants to spend all this time? But, when you see that final finish where it's really beautifully smooth, even the, the shinier something gets, the more you see the imperfection. So, and actually, this will be lighter when I'm done because I'll block sand down till probably 99% of this is not even on the machine, on the uh, on the part. Anyway, out here there's some. This is one of those days where a lot of people that skip this day and say, "Well, I'm one day ahead. I run off and." went to the next step but in the long run they've lost because it's it's going to catch up with you when you start putting the filler coats on anyway this is the product it's very i, I don't even know i think it's two bucks very inexpensive every year buy a new can or go spackle your house with what's left over um just waiting for that dap to dry. One of the things, the most important thing I've found in picking wood out, and it's quarter inch wood that I need, is to try to get a piece of straight grain. Although these are all the light pieces, and I'm trying to find, 
not the lightest piece, but the piece that has the straightest grain, because I really don't want to have wind up with a set of twisted flaps. And because we're going to do an experiment on this plane at some future time, we're going to make Nomex flaps. So I'll have a wood flap and a Nomex flap. And I don't want to compare apples to twisted wood or oranges. So the first thing I want to do is weigh up, get a gut weight on all of these. These are all... I thought you weighed these already, Mike. <laughs> no. How come I got to do this over and over again? No, anyway. Seriously, the, the mistake of all time is to just grab the lightest piece out of the pile. We don't want to do that. I'm looking for a piece that is relatively straight. Okay, we're going to pull Mike's cowling mold apart, and what we're doing, just little by little taking the wood off without trying not to cut the rubber. This is the first time Mike's gone through this, so as soon as he figures out, uh, you know, if, if this is going to be a good mold, then we're going to start practicing making cardinal cowlings, and we'll make one a day. So you can not only be making stooges every day, you can be making cardinal cowlings. Jeez, this could be, this could you could be in business. <laughs> this could become a full-time job. <laughs> it is a full-time job. It's either this or Home Depotville for you and me. <laughs> yeah, well, it's getting pretty close to Home Depot. <laughs> Welfare it's is... It's supposed to snow Sunday. You, you can make another thousand dollars mushing yeah. snow around it. You know, Welfare is in my program soon. Uh, okay, <laughs> here we go. All right, the wood... Whenever you're going to make this kind of cowl, uh, George Venturini has those nice <coughs> plexiglass things that he's <coughs> going to make me soon. Notice I don't have them yet, though. You just You want to slice that off. At least this is my way of doing it. And we want to wind up with a block, and then we're going to make a little garage part for that block so we can drop the block in and it'll have support on the sides. This is really the secret to any good flap, is you got to go through all the wood. Again, I make the point because it's really a valid one. Many times I've used the lightest piece of wood. It's, oh, this one's three grams light or five grams. Carve up a flap, and at the end of it, I have one of those dutchy pretzel kind of flaps. So I'm going to select the two pieces of wood that I think are uh, the straightest and then favoring the light end of the wood selection. Mike will be very careful. I know Mike's going to be careful as he sticks the knife into that plug. We want to save that plug, by the way. We don't want to destroy the plug. So this way we'll both be busy for the next uh, little bit of time here. We can get several little jobs done in the same day, I hope. As you can see, we've had uh, really good success. Oh man, that's going to be a beauty. <laughs> that is nice. Now once you once you get to this point, and if you don't destroy this, the idea is we want to keep the plug. You understand why? If if Peabody or somebody borrows this and doesn't give it back, like you know, people can tend to borrow thing. Yeah. Well, or well, if somebody wants, I could mail this to them if they want to make their own. Couldn't we fill this hole in? No, you can't fill it in reasonably. But you're gonna, you're gonna have an imperfection. See, we got we've got one air bubble down there. If every part will have a, a dimple on it that'll sand off, but you got to make sure each time you do it that you just don't keep tearing us up. If we made a thousand of these, this piece will will get ruined. But you're gonna get plenty of cows out of that. That is, boy, that is that's the nicest one. Let's see, look at the finish on that cow. The finish is even nice. So yeah, like if a guy like Larry Cunningham wants to make, he likes to work with, with little mold. You could just send him this mold, make the thing, and send it back. Hmm. But we still have the plug. We could still, now you could even, if you were really in production, you could go make another one and be making two a day. I think one a day is enough. Compared to how much carbon did you put into this? Legitimate. How much time went into carving this thing up? <sighs> Took all day, didn't it? Yeah. The better part of an eight-hour day. And then how many hours to finish it? I mean, and how much... Yeah. And every one that comes out of there will be ready to roll. Later today, we'll lay one up. That's great. Now, one of the next steps here, and clean this up, we put mold release, silicone, we got some stuff in here, Mike. It's silicone mold release, even though you don't really need it. We also made a little box. Now, what we want to do, if, if for some reason, you don't want to have the box that you have a, a kink, and you don't want it to, when you're pushing on it, that you can pull it out. But then when you want to take the part out, we want to take that out. So these little parts are just a little fixture to hold the box in place. The other choice is you could make this side of the mold an inch wide and put another $50 worth of molding rubber in there. That, that doesn't seem to work as well either. Now Mike, pre-cut all the parts. 
He's got his silica filler ready. We're going to mix up some West Systems resin here, and this is going to be his first cowl layup. Mixing up some, some colloidal silica into paste so that Mike can get the corners real nice. We cut all our little patterns roughly, and they don't really have to be super accurate. This is three ounce satin weave cloth. The nice part with a mold like this, the first time, this is the first one you're doing. Yeah. So you have a time window of about 15 to 20 minutes. And you'll feel when the epoxy starts to turn into jello, then you know you're you're basically at the end of your your window. You gotta go throw that batch out and go mix another batch. But usually you can do this with one batch of an ounce. Okay, then whenever you want, you can just start dumping pieces in. And when you want to do your count that you have six, I would start with six. You're into the... Okay, so you just, just check each side. This side you got one, this side you got two. Just dump in another one. And that little padding motion is the whole... Just... Just pat it in. It, the satin weave, the cloth conforms really nice. Just wet it down, even with a little more resin. Better in the beginning, the first couple you do, to have too much resin, then we'll soak it out with paper towels at the end. Did manage to salvage the plug, and that was that was one of my concerns. I was glad we that we did not lose this because there may come a time when we want to make another mold, or we could take this mold now and make some modification or change to it or whatever and, and that would be very convenient that we didn't have to make this carve the whole thing from a block again. And this fits a standard kit, production kit. Mike's laying up the rest of that cowling and by the way he is becoming an expert. Mike, Mike the cowling maker. <laughs> While he's doing that, I'm going to try to lay out the, the overall shape of the flaps. The two things I'd like to do, but I'm probably not going to get to do both of them. I wanted to make the horn and rough out the flaps. And that's going to be relatively easy. What I'm going to do, because I'm changing, look at this. <laughs> Who, this Ford? There's the Ford people. Yeah, maybe. Not a bad job for Mike's first layup. Now, how long did that take you, roughly? Half an hour? Yes. Okay, next one will take 20 minutes. Next one, 15. Get rid of that. Clean the table off, and then uh, I'll make up some flaps here. So one of the things, because this is four inch wood, I can always feel which way. One side of it is always a little bit stiffer than the other. In this case, it's not. This is the stiffer of the two sides. You can feel it's harder wood. So in this case, because I want the flaps, I'm not looking to make the world's lightest pretzels. I want relatively stiff flaps. These are the two stiff edges, so I can lay out one of the flaps. Usually you can tell by looking at the grain, and I don't know if I'm going to be able to get this accurately, but when the grain is in like this, here's, here's a good example, and it's sea grain, you can see the ripples going through it. That grain, this would be the part of the flap you want to be the root. Here, where it's just it's going off the grain a little bit, we can make this part the tip. So I'm trying to isolate which is the stiffest, hardest part of this wood, and it's going to be down at this end, and it's going to be this side that I cut the flap from. It's in back and forth here today, but this is one of the real quality steps that Mike's puts into his stooges. First off, after they're done, they're wrapped with carbon fiber. There's just just as insurance within insurance, and then to fuel proof it. We put on a special mix of West Systems resin with black dye in it. And when that's dry, that really has a nice professional look to it. Plus, it'll make it safer. Oh, yeah. Okay, so we're going to bounce back now. Let's see. Time to bounce back and do some flaps. You keep, see, we're trying to, trying to do a lot of things at once here. Things You didn't save the label for this? No. This is the sticky back paper from Woodworker Paradise. That's where you got this? Right. Woodworker Paradise. And this is the real rough stuff Mike uses on the Stooges. But this is when you get it in grits. So we need a roll of 220 and a roll of 320 now. But unfortunately, I didn't save the package either. This stuff has it has some use, but it's it's half as good as 
the gray stuff. I, I much prefer the gray. I don't even know what. You don't have the. Here you go, boss. Oh, look at this. The boss has it. Here we go. Sun gold abrasives. Here it is. This is the stuff I really like. And carving and sand in a flap here. We're going to be using some abrasive, so I'm <laughs> I just wish we had the 320 and the 220. <laughs> We need pizza and we have a bagel. <laughs> We're in multitasking city. <laughs> Stooge is jumping out the window on me. <laughs> oh, man. Anyway, we're going to rough out the flap shape. I'm making them a little longer than they have to be because I don't want to carve the tip in until we have the horn in place. And as always, now... If you really want to be rich in life, you really want you want more money than what's that Microsoft guy, Bill Gates, figure out a pen that writes on balsa wood. You would be independent, because I'll buy the first 2,000 pens. Anyway, I heard a cool thing from Warren Walker. Warren Walker is doing some volunteer work on a Mark 14 Spitfire and has agreed to, as always, graciously send me some photographs. I have a better idea, Warren. Jump in a plane, take the key, and fly over to Jersey. Nobody will know it's over here, and we'll just keep it. Now, the reason I leave the flaps oversized, just another tip, a thing that's, that's worth mentioning. A lot of times you get to the end of the wing tip, and you want to make the flap exactly to match the curve and the shape. And, and what happens, you, you, you make the flap, you put the horn on, and it's a sixteenth in, and you can't get the curve back. So if the flap is oversized, right to the very end... Now, I, Again, mentioning something that I think is real important is that the both flaps are relatively the same stiffness. The worst of all worlds, again, would be one real buttery and one real stiff. And that's one of the advantages when we go to make Nomex flaps. One of them is, is they are relatively identical because the materials are the same. Where if you have two pieces of wood and the grain is different, it can be a problem. Now, all through, the, all through the process of making the flaps, I want to make, and I want to use that hard side of the wood. See, most people would be prone to use the soft side. For a flap, I would like to use the hard side. All through the process, because this is an equal panel plane, I want to be sure I have the flaps exact mirror images of each other. A funny story, I remember Casmanato had a plane at one time that had one built-up flap and one solid flap. And when I asked him about it, you know, he gave me that, that grin that he always has, and he says, ah, inside flap must be a stiffer, yeah. <laughs> and I was wondering, I was wondering, I would think it's the opposite. You want the outboard flap stiffer. And then I said, what am I, crazy? You want them equal. I don't want them different. I'm a believer in, and people know that that's the way I like to do things. Equal panel planes, where things are equal, it seems a lot easier to... Uh, for me, anyway. Maybe I'm just not that good. Maybe other people are a lot better than I am. But not maybe. They probably are. Anyway, I really look forward to seeing Warren Walker's... And I know that we've seen pictures of his shop on the video. I'm sure he can have a tremendous contribution to the world of restoring. It's a Mark 14, too. Basically what the Sea Fire was. Now, for sure, I don't want to get involved in carving a tip. In fact, I would prefer, probably... To add a little block to the tip where the grain is going in this dimension because all that end grain is, is going to be a very weak area. We'll see when we actually finish it up. I just wanted to lay this out to get a rough look at it. And we'll be ready to start boy, with this multitasking going. We'll be ready to start carving flaps. This is one of the little, there's just one of the ways I like to make flaps. I like to get a center line around the whole part. Now I know there's all kind of good ways to make them with rods and blocks and jigs and but this way I found just makes for uh, the easiest way I know of to make them. I'm going to work toward a center line at every operation and it's not really that complex. The single most important thing is to get the right piece of wood that's sea grain and not really the lightest piece of wood in your inventory. Once you have that, you're, you're pretty well safe. It's when you try to use up that punk piece of A-grain wood that you wind up really defeating the whole purpose of it. Anyway, start with a center line down all sides of it. 
Yeah, just a couple of thoughts on flap shapes, things that I've uh, encountered over the years that may be a help to you when you want to make a set of flaps. You know, in its basic form, this is what a flap is supposed to do. In its deflected state, that's what we're trying to achieve with a flap deflection. This is, I don't pretend to be an aerodynamic engineer. The person that could really answer this would be somebody like Keith Trossel or somebody that has a background in engineering, maybe Bill Netspin. But I know one thing, this is basic, seat of the pants, get a rough understanding of what's happening. What's happening is the air is traveling over this side of the wing, is going a longer distance. That path is longer than this path. So in essence, what happens, this air on top gets stretched out and it's lighter than the air underneath it and that's what's creating what we experience as lift. So this is, this is what we're trying to control with a flap. Now, this what I'm putting on the paper here is just my impression of seated a pants stuff that I've done over the years. I just want to mention that some of this information I gained from Al Raby from his articles that he shared with everybody years ago. A lot of it comes from Big Jim, but most of it is just from seat of the pants, and that means just making planes with removable flaps that came on and off. Now, what I remember reading was that these flaps, thin, relatively straight flaps, gave more lift than when actually part of the airfoil was moved and deflected at given amounts. Now, I remember that. I never really hadn't had enough education in aerodynamics and fluid dynamics to know exactly why and how that happened. But a few things that I know happened for sure. Sealing the hinge line is a significant gain. It's always a gain. Because as you have a low pressure area here and a relatively high pressure area here, it can't bleed through. So I always design right from the very beginning the idea, I don't care how close the flap is to the, to the, the back of the wing or the tail because I'm going to seal that with hinge line sealing tape anyway. So I don't give a lot of thought to making a real tight hinge line. A lot of people do think that a tight hinge line is what they want, but they don't want to seal it. They don't like the fact the plane has tape on it, but I've found that this is absolutely the only way that I'm comfortable or happy knowing I have the best possible amount of lift coming off the wing. And this, and, and I'm, I'm wondering if there isn't some real scientific reason that thicker flaps don't seem to work as well as thin ones. There probably is. And it probably relates to the drag factor as, as the air goes back through this. I wouldn't even get into that. That doesn't matter. What does matter to me is, and I've, I've done this test over and over and over, so from me, under my conditions, I know this is how I want it to be. One of the tests that I did, I wanted to find out years ago, and I, I built a plane, that purple and yellow plane that we still have, that has the YS in it now, called the tweener, and I made three sets of flaps for the plane. In the course of making it, I made, having read all the Al Rabe things, having discussed it with Big Jim, having talked to other people, I just said, well, let's see what's going to work for me. And what I tried to do, I mean, this is exactly the same plane at the same time at the same field. I made removable flaps and elevators. And I had a pair of elevators that had very little taper here. I mean, this might have gone down a sixteenth of an inch. And then I made a pair of flaps that had a tremendous taper. They almost came to a razor point. And at one time, I had talked to Billy Woolridge when we were going cross country. We stopped in an air museum and noticed that all of the real high performance planes had razor edges at the back of the flaps and we were wondering if that was going to be worth anything. So I made a set of those flaps. I also made a set of the flaps that I will call them Juno flaps, the little I-beam flaps that have a little break on them. I had made several planes with these built up flaps that similar to a Juno, a Billy Woolridge plane, and I never was really happy with I never really was totally convinced that, that I had the same amount of performance I had when I built the exact same plane with straight flaps. And I had several of these planes that were aerodynamically the same except for small differences like the controls 
the flap areas and the tail shapes and they became the basis of what I felt was my education learning about basic stunt aerodynamics. One of the things that, that this allowed me to do is in the real world go to the field, pull the wire out, put the, put the flaps on and what's happened over the years is this set of flaps we used for test painting purposes and doing some carbon fiber work I don't even have these flaps anymore and when I when I sent the plane up to New England it had this set of flaps on and when it came back it had this set so Dave might have found that he liked this set of flaps better I'm not sure but this was the, this is the point I'm making I have always liked having flaps or flaps that at the root were a quarter of an inch and at the tip an eighth that amount of taper seemed to be the best compromise and definitely made out of sea grain not ultra light balsa wood and Joe Adamusco and I have both when we did the Spitfire he found some incredible sea grain wood those Spitfires have flaps they feel like they're made out of iron before you even put dope on them but anyway this is roughly what I've come to the conclusion that for me and for my designs, I like the airfoil that I've evolved using over the last six, eight planes, the Spitfires. They've all basically been very similar airfoil. I always like the flaps to be three inches at the root, two inches at the tip, unless it's an experimental plane. In this case, it's going to have a little taper at the tip. But these numbers have all basically given me planes that I was very comfortable flying. Years ago, too, one of the other things I used to do all the time is use as many hinges as possible, thinking I wouldn't have to tape the hinge lines or I'd be, I'd have some trim advantage. I have since abandoned the let's see how many hinges we can put on a wing thing and just totally seal all the hinge lines before I ever even fly the plane. Now, even these planes, the few of them left that still have a lot of hinges as opposed to five, which is normal. These planes, I still take the hinge lines. I remember like it was yesterday, the one flight I flew without the hinge lines taped on Miss Ashley to see if there would be any, any kind of improvement, any performance gain. And I remember almost crashing on the wing over. So my suggestion, if you get nothing else out of this, tape the hinge lines all the time. I prefer taped hinge lines. Now the other point I want to make is as I'm making flaps, I'm going to be looking out for some, some little bit better technology in the future. We're going to try to make Nomex flaps. And I thought one of the things, when I get that technology to where I'm real happy and comfortable with it, I'd make a spare set of flaps for Miss Ashley, just as a test plane, because it's removable. See, some of the planes I would have to, in, in, this, in the case of this plane, I would have to cut the plane apart to get the flaps off. If you decide to make even a plane that's not a take-apart plane, I would highly recommend that you can take the flaps off. And if you, bu if you build a flap that's twisted, bent, or some way you're not happy, take it off. Same with the elevators. But of course the ultimate is when you can have the whole plane come apart. And in this case, say we want to replace the tail, heavier tail, lighter tail, bigger tail, airfoil tail, flat tail, change the control ratio, and it, it, it goes on and on and on how many good features you buy by having the plane take apart instead of one piece. Another thing that seems significant too is the heavier a plane is, the heavier it tends to be, the higher the wing loading, the more it benefits from sealed flap hinge lines, which would make sense as you're using the lift, putting it under more and more stress. And it even seems like on some planes, like the smaller Cardinals, the Profile Cardinals, the Brodak Cardinals, even they benefit from hinge line tape. thing I did is get a brand new piece of sticky back paper down on my flat surface here because I'm going to be using that from time and this part in the, part in the, the building up forward we're going to be using this and I want it to be a relatively new piece it's not all ginched up if you really have enough room on your table you can put a piece of like 100 a piece of 220 by the way you want to get rid of some of the calluses on your hands this is a good way to do it if you don't have sticky back paper, another choice is you can spray contact cement down on the table and just make your own sticky back paper. But the stuff that Mike's bought, this is really good quality stuff. He uses that in manufacturing the Stooges. Now that we have that, we have a we can chew our edges when it comes time 
And again, I'm making mirror images, so sometimes I just want to take just a little bit off. But it's time to do our shaping. And it, the only real shaping I do on this is I want to make sure that I'm a full quarter inch at one side and roughly an eighth of an inch at the trailing edge. Easiest way I know to do that is just lay eighth inch tape right over the center line. The best material I know is the masking tape, the eighth inch masking tape, because I'm just using it as a, as a guide. The fact that I start with a 90 degree edge in the part that's going to be the hinge line, and that I get the tape centered on the trailing edge, because what I'm going to do is basically carve and sand up to this line. Again, there's a lot of good ways to make flaps. I think we even had a little confusion not long ago with the all these rods Mike Costello was using. Yeah, that can work. As long as when you're done with it, you have two perfectly equal and symmetrical flaps. You don't have one a lot stiffer than the other one. Sight that I'm right down in the center. That I've found is never to hold the plane straight, always on an angle. And because I'm only trying to take off a sixteenth of an inch on each side, I don't want to make it too thin at the back either. So I'm just taking that, trying to get it all off in one shaving. Because we basically, we don't want to make this part any thinner. I just want to get a blend from one side to the other from an eighth to a quarter. You really only get one or two cuts and you've got enough material off. Now I'm going to take, get a sanding block and just dress this high point off and I'm done with one side of the flap. The thing is I'm not looking to remove a lot of material and make that trailing edge paper thin and razor sharp. And I've even gone so far in the past, I've taken and put on the trailing edge, glued a piece of eighth inch square spruce which worked nice, but I think that's really getting into overkill. Because this is, this is just one of the times a year we're in this this tremendous multitasking. By the way, I keep this on a straight edge of the table while I'm chewing this up. Get this last little bit off and then I'll start sanding. But I thought you'd enjoy, it's about a five minute segment. Back from 19, believe it or not, 1992 when I made the original aluminum stooge for, who did I make it for? Walt Russell. And I think Mike's stooge has evolved so well, but it just shows a real basic way of making it, but the real way is just basically copy Mike's design or, and what I thought Mike should do is come up with a set of plans for, uh, and publish them or sell them or give them away or whatever. His stooge really does work the best of any I've ever used and you never have to worry about pulling out the tail wheel. I'm block sanding these down. Let's take a five minute break and I want to put that footage on this. Now, now remember, this footage goes back to 1992. This was technology that was good in 1992. I think Mike's is even better, but this gives you a comparison of just how good Mike's stuff is relative to the old stuff. Now this is a special request. I, everybody's seen the little pro stunt, the uh, Bobby Hunt uh, type of uh, stooges. This stooge you've seen in all the videos. Let's just go over how this works. A uh, special request from one of my favorite customers, Walt Russell. I'm going to try to make him up uh, a similar stooge today. Uh, obviously the advantage of this stooge is that you don't put any strain on a tail wheel and obviously when a plane gets old uh, there's a chance you'll either pull a tail wheel out or the plane will release uh, when you don't want it to. What happens is as the model is in here, of course the stab is here and it's pushing here. It's restrained with, uh, you can see this is well, this has probably launched 10,000 flights already. Uh, the tail of the plane is here and it's restrained by this piece of wire. So when you run out to the handle and you pull this piece of wire out, now that can just flop forward. The plane rides through there, nice and clean. And uh, like I said, I'm going to try to make up a little copy of this stooge for uh, Walt Russell of some similar design. I don't know how it'll be, but uh, start working on that this afternoon. And of course, we still have in stock the ordinary stooges, the uh, ordinary. 
the, uh, the typical stooge that the release is from the tail wheel. Now, step one, we went and bought some real heavy duty uh, galvanized hinges. Obviously, we don't want this to rust. Obviously, you want to get this pin lubricated real well, so when this, you don't want this to flap down, bounce up, and hit the tail before the plane releases. So we have these nice little bush hinges. They're galvanized, so they should never rust. Now keep this nice and lubricated. Using galvanized plated 832 screws and blind nuts, of course, and we're going to cut the back of these off. Now we didn't, we couldn't get a piece of aluminum like this, and actually aluminum is overkill. Now we're going to leave this stooge, if you can see this, if you make one out of wood, leave it extra long. I'm leaving it longer than my original one, so that if, if these holes start to deteriorate from putting nails in, you can just move up and use the next hole, move up, use the next hole. And actually the middle piece here you're going to use as the, the runway for the tail wheel. So uh, by uh, kind of upgrading this from my original design here, I'm um, leaving it almost double the length. You can obviously can saw this off anytime you want. You should be able to make this stooge up in one day. Uh, I'm going to try to finish this up today. I'll work on it all day until I get it finished and put a couple of coats of uh, finish on it so the oil doesn't deteriorate it. But that's the first step, and I'll try to run through this real quick as we're doing it. Step one, get the hinges aligned. you got to leave enough room that the body of an average stunt ship will fit in there. Oops, something just fell out of my ear. We want to keep this di this dimension kind of constant, and then we're going to make two little blocks here. I'll make these out of motor mount wood, and then I have to fashion these pieces out of plywood. And this is ordinary pipe, uh, whatever you call it, the stuff that insulates pipes. And it never never has scratched the plane yet. The only time I've ever had trouble with it was I was trying out a pair of uh, new wheels, and they were very tiny and skimpy, and I pulled on the string too hard. And I cocked the plane in the stooge and put a little dent in the body. And that's the only damage I've ever done with this stooge. This stooge has been around since uh, 1979, and it's launched a lot of planes. these nuts nice and flat. They're 832 screws. Nice and flat so this will lay nice on the concrete or in the grass. Now well, remember in grass what I used to use I used to make up some uh, 530 second wire hooks just a big L-shaped hook and shove them in the ground about two feet. Or obviously some way of securing this and an alternative way is to take a, a couple of bricks and lay them on the back of this. Put the hooks in and the bricks too. Uh, all kind of ways, but make sure this is secure. You don't want to have what happened to you, have what happened to Jimmy Casal as the stooge released here and just hit him in the hand with the carbon prop. Not a fun thing to have happen, and that is on one of our videos, uh, Jimmy's scar, and uh, appreciate that he shared the, uh, the information with us. Doesn't want anybody else to have it happen to them. All right, we're going to make the uprights. The next thing I had to do, let's go over here to this one, using all 832 uh, screws, recess the blind nuts, made this up from three quarter inch, uh, the same boards that we used to make motor mounts out of rock hard maple. Had to relieve this to go against the hinge. Let's see if we can do this. So you get a nice tight fit in there. 
and obviously you want a 90 degree angle. So that's the next step is to fashion up these ports, make a matched pair. Three quarter inch rock hard maple is a good uh, material. Now another thing, these arms need not be uh, any longer than this. If you make them longer than this, what happens, and I've had it happen already, they will jump up and hit the tail on some planes that have a very low tail wheel. So uh, these arms need only be maybe uh, two inches long. And I measured this right off of my stooge to make sure we're making a uh, legitimate copy here of this thing. And uh, after four hours of working on this thing, uh, it's starting to shape up. All right, we mixed up some slow drying epoxy. And we epoxied these arms. This one we had to relieve for the screw head, because obviously these have to go back full 90 degrees. So we leave the screw head, and now we can file the bottom of these or grind them until these sit perfectly even. That's the next step in this process. And we're putting epoxy on all the screws as we put it together, so it'll kind of stay together better in one piece. Hopefully with all the uh, 10 or 15 years this is gonna be in use. We put in the pieces, 832 machine screws and blind nuts. And this is just regular pipe wrapping foam. And we'll obviously cut another piece for that. So there she sits, ready to go. Now, obviously suggest that if you use this in grass, you attach this in three or four places and put a brick on it, a rock, whatever's handy, a toolbox even. And keep the hinges well oiled. Number one priority, oil the hinges. You can see I put little brass bushings in here. Epoxy them in, this epoxy's still drying. Now one of the things is, I purposely drill these holes a little bit cocked to each other so that this rod kind of stays in it. It's not just a sloppy fit and it wouldn't come out with vibration. Obviously this end of the rod, you would hook a line and a line clip too. And uh, on the other end, I suggest using a reel if you notice, I have a reel, and of course that reel just reels in the line then. Brass bushings all throughout. Should get a lot of launches out of this. And of course, one of the nice things, as we always do, we give uh, same day service. I don't know if I get Mike's stuff, and I look back 1992, and I have to laugh. He's really come a long way. These things really are nice, and we're gonna we'll put, hopefully show one. He'll have one finished here before the day's out. We've got so many things going on at the same time here. I want to go finish sanding those slaps. Hope you enjoyed that old footage. That, wasn't I young and handsome back then? You mean no? Looking at young and handsome, this is even further back. <laughs> what was I thinking? I wonder if I was thinking, God, the girls will just find me attractive. Oh, God. <laughs> anyway, it's funny to look back at these old... You think I'm bad? Look at Paul Walker, what he thought was cute back then. <laughs> Dennis. Oh, man, where's Gieske? Well, Gieske looks the same 100 years later. <laughs> oh, man. It was fun, though. Hey, it's always good looking at that old footage, boy. That's a, that's a real joy. Now, it, it helps if you have a flat piece of table to hold this on while you're doing the sanding and some of that nice sticky back sandpaper on a block. And I like to do, this is kind of time consuming, I just get all the, the little marks out. If you have somebody around that's not making stooges, not making uh, parts for stooges, you can have them hold a vacuum cleaner here and get rid of all the dust. But I'm gonna work my way up to the tape, but I don't wanna make it any thinner than the tape. And I like to start with maybe, uh, I think this is 80 grit, Mike's stuff. 80 grit, and then wind up with about 320 or 400. But always we using a sanding block, no hand sanding. And always, if possible, having it down on a flat table. A little tip that'll work if you're using a sanding bench or something a little similar to that. Or even if you just have sandpaper on a table. The sandpaper can help hold the part. 
What's nice about this, while I'm doing the final sanding, because it's this fine dust that's hard to keep control of in the house, that, that part, that'll help hold it right in position while you get the final little amount of dust that's going to go off of it. Well, I wish I could. I wish I could go back over the years and replace all the flaps I made. I mean, I made some flaps years ago. I was trying to use a three-pound wood, and you, that's the one place on a plane you really can't skimp is on flap wood. It's just such an advantage for me, anyway, always to have the flat side down. Even if you were going to use the two rods, the thing like Estella likes, you could put sandpaper where the flap was and you wouldn't even have to hold it. It would kind of act like a like a router table end. We used to have a router pit. Again, somebody borrowed it. We used to have this real nice router table. It's a router pad, they call it. Oh, let me borrow that, Wendy. I'll give it right back. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, we're going to have to change some of our loaner policies around here. But anyway, that it's that fine. This is the fine dust that I really have a problem with with Karen when she breathes it in. And actually, it's no good for anybody to breathe it in. But sanding and carving these out is just a matter of a few minutes, and I try to keep that surface relatively flat and straight. A smooth trailing edge, a little radius. I just want to put a radius. I don't want to take off the center line if I can help it. And it just takes a couple of swipes for the sanding block to be there. The thing you don't want to do is hold it up in your lap or hold it in your hand or something where it can, you can even sand a bow into it. And I'll do all the final sanding with this big long block. But I've worked from a center line toward the center line for the whole the whole operation. So I hope I haven't either carved or relieved any stress that's in the wood. Again, the most important thing is the quality of the wood. The next thing is I want to put the the angle on here. I'm not going to have to cut the hinge pockets yet, but I want to put the angle on here. But the way I've always done that in the past, because what I ought to do is make sure these are straight, and again, at every step, make sure they're symmetrical. They are. But working off that edge, what I do is I lay down a piece of eighth inch tape, Now that eighth inch tape sets this piece of tape in place, and of course you could use another piece of eighth inch if you wanted to. You could use a piece of anything. It's just going to set this edge. And this is the line I'm going to work off of. Now there's two real good ways to do this that I've found. Just get this right to the edge. Now if you're real good at carving and you can just carve you take that piece off and you basically can carve that angle right in there if you're not real comfortable with that you could take either this piece of eighth inch tape let me see if i have another piece here I had the piece i torn off if you want to be really uh conservative what you want to do is cover the line i don't really have to do this i'm so good but but that would give you another way of doing it. And the trick is get a brand new blade or a plane and just take that corner off and do the last little bit sanding it. A lot of times you can use a plane. Just to get the corner off. But the last little bit you almost always have to do with a sanding block. I always like to hold the plane on an angle, not straight. Set it for a very small cut. I'd rather take a lot of small cuts. If the, if the blade is down too far on a plane, it'll just, just tear a piece off here. Yeah, 
to rest a little bit and just we can actually feel when you're rubbing up on the tape and I like to leave the line on which works my way right down the flap and then using the final thing using the really long sanding block that would give me a nice a nice final edge on there now to do the other side all I need to do is reverse the whole thing reverse the tape and I'll have both cuts on there once I take the tape off this edge will be a quarter inch this edge will be an eighth inch and that should be about uh, as good as I'm going to be able to get a flap making it out of balsa wood until we get time to do more of the Nomex testing and we will be doing that of course check when I put the tape on the other side that I look from this side and see if I have it perfectly symmetrical in this case it's ready to carve we got a radius a nice radius on the trailing edge and this angle cut what's left now is to make an exact copy of the same thing on this flap and we should have our flaps in rough cut form make an exact copy of this hinging system with the removable pin and with the taped hinge this is what we're trying to replicate Now that the flaps are all shaped, the last thing I want to do, I hope I can get this done today, in fact, I need to measure up accurately because this is a very wide fuselage. A stock horn is probably not going to be wide enough. And make up the horn. And it might be an interesting little uh, sidebar in case you want to make up your own custom one-of-a-kind horns. Now I'm trying to get a, a good dimension here to see if I have one exactly the size I want. See I have some special ones in here but the majority of them are three and a half and I need one just a little bit bigger than three and a half. And this is a standard three and a half. All right, whenever, whenever we make these we always make a few extra a little bit bigger. But I want one right in between there, see? So off camera I'm going to go through these and try to find the spacing that I really want to wind up with. I've lucked out. <laughs> the, first, the first time in a long time we've lucked out here. Because that fuselage is so wide and I don't want to have, I want to have a little bit of balsa between the end of the flap and the fuselage as a fine tuning. What I did with Miss Ashley, and it was a mistake, I made this horn almost rubbing on the side of the fuselage because I wanted a tight gap what I really need to do is leave a little bit of balsa on there so I can make the equivalent of a gasket or a fillet one way or another. So we lucked out. Hooray! First time in a long time we've lucked out on anything. Now the first thing I need to do, I'm going to drill out this bushing and put in an eighth inch bushing. The reason I want to have an eighth inch bushing in here, so I'm going to have the choice, and the same as Miss Ashley and all of our other planes, Spitfires and everything, I'll have a choice of taking a little piece of tubing in or out and having slop or no slop. And that'll be all built into the, to the flap horn. These are precision eighth inch bushings. And I want to get the drill size exact. It's a 143. Because this is going to be my, my method of getting slop and no slop into the system. I'll use an eighth inch piece of copper tubing in there as a bushing to set neutral and then when I want to have slop I can take that little piece of bushing off. This fits in there. It's a real nice precision fit. And now what this is going to do, this will be my little bushing over the 330 second wire. So when I take this piece a little, it'll wind up being a little piece of tubing. When I take that piece out and put 330 second wire in here, I'll have exactly the amount of slop that I know has worked well for me in the past step is I want to drill this bushing out replace it with that the eighth inch one drilled out with a number with a 142 drill now with the bushing off and an 093 rod in there 
that's exactly the right amount of slop, at least that I found for my trim. And this hole is a tight fit. And after I'm done, now what I'm going to do is put Stay Bright Silver Solder on this whole area and then re-drill these holes with precision drills. And I suggest everybody, even though you don't have to, a little Stay Bright Silver Solder up there will just make that a lot more secure. After I silver solder that all in, deflux with baking soda and water. See, the thing is, now it's not pretty, but it's a lot a lot more solid, hopefully, when you go for that, that long-term plan. Now, I want to make the little clips that hold the horn also. The two last things I wanted to make the clips, but also, when I'm going to insert this into aluminum tubes, which I'm going to do on this plane, this is going to insert into an aluminum tube. One of the choices I have is I can take about a quarter of an inch off of this for the length. Of course, I don't need this. It, this. The tube itself acts as some of the support, and that gets rid of a little weight, and I can take a little material off here also as a way to just to lighten up, get rid of some of the dead weight on a horn. I wouldn't shorten the arms like this unless these are going to go into aluminum or brass tubes. And because this is a take-apart plane, we're going to be taking this on and off. Now, also, I can take just a little bit of material off here, do that with the Dremel tool, and then I need to make my clips. And the reason I don't make horns with the tubing is I used to make horns that had a piece of tubing here. And what would happen is one drop of CA would get in there after the wing is all built, and by the time you broke it off the back of the wing, the wing was destroyed. The wrapping method, using a little piece of tin to wrap it, it allows you to sneak a little knife or something in there and get it clean. It's an option you don't have if you use the tubing. some tin strips from one of my old taffender tanks. Tin can doesn't really even matter. And then what I like to do is just get all the, the ratty edges off the material. And I just use some kind of flat end flat nose plier. The reason I like this system much better than tubing is I can get in there if I have to, and I'll put a drop of that Warren Walker oil in there, because if that if that glue gets in there while you're working on a machine, and that's the, you can't get it off the back of the wing conveniently. Now, if you make it too tight, and it looks like we've got it pinched a little bit on the tight side, usually just touching it this way, and you've got it. So you can adjust your clearance by just pinching it this way. Always roughen that up. Put some, make it like a washboard with a, uh, a parting wheel. Just roughen this up. And you'll be ready to install this on the back of the wing. Put a drop of that Warren Walker lubricant on there. Make sure that the, the purpose of that is so I don't wind up and how easy it is. The first time it happens to you, you really get annoyed. I don't want any chance that that CA is going to stick on that. As, a, as an example, I've had this, this final stack of fans. You can't feel that at all. Now, even on places like the leading edge, look at that powder there. Isn't that nice? Even a difficult area to sand like this, that vinyl spackle. You let it dry an hour or so, a couple hours. It's been drying all day here. Now, I hope you got some good information off this tape some interesting things you can uh, apply to your own modeling right away. Please share the tapes. Make sure everybody uh, shares the information. On the next tape we're going to install the horn, set up the controls, the hinges, finish the flaps, the tips. We'll also tomorrow see what Mike's cowling looks like when we pull it out of the mold for the first time. He's going to Put the final touches and the finish on his batch of stooges.
the pants are ready for the final buff out and installing the wheels. There are a lot of projects going on at the same time. And we should have delivery of our next couple of yards of carbon to make up another fuselage and be well into the fuselage in the next couple of tapes. Again, a lot of stuff coming up on the next tapes. I really hope you're enjoying them and I hope you'll enjoy the benefit of having uh, being able to share your life with us and, and us with you of course. So please feel free to send us some pictures. And to Warren Walker who we hope is going to be sharing some pictures of his Spitfire restoration out there in California. Looking forward to it. We're even setting some tentative plans in motion here to uh, visit England again this summer. Sharing life is something that's pretty special. Without video, I don't know how you could even get to know peeps. And boy, I'm excited as I've ever been about an airplane. Thinking about the future of this typhoon. Just one of the things, a little sneak preview of what'll be coming up soon. The weather should be breaking, and I hope we're going to be able to get out and run this puppy. A special thanks to Elliot Scott for a generous gift of this motor for Christmas.